there. We can have time for questions or whatever. And then we'll go into our nomination. So use whatever free time we have to either approach the friend you like especially well or the guy you want to get back at. Say, hey, I'd like to nominate you. Go with that. So thank you so much. All right. Are you guys ready for me? Very good. Yes. Can you hear us? Uh, yep. Uh, you can see my screen okay? Am I sharing the honeybee vaccine screen you should see? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. Yeah, and I don't know. Um, I, I sent a bio to Brian, so I'm not going to bore you with, with my history, but uh, uh, that should be available for you if you want to see where I came from. I'll probably mention, mention it uh, as we go through. I really did try to get out there. I've never been to Salt Lake City before. I was looking forward to it, uh, but just couldn't get there uh, last night. So uh, I, I'm sorry for this. I really like to be in front of uh, audiences so I can interact and see who you are, and it, you know, it just creates a lot better interaction. But I'll do my best for you here uh, to do some, some virtual lecture for you. Uh, so most of the pictures that I'm going to show you are going to be pictures that uh, I've even taken from my my or my students have taken from uh, our apiary or from my my travels around uh, the industry. So, first one I'm going to talk about is the vaccine. So I can get my there we go. All right. So I'm going to give you guys a little bit of background on immunity. Uh, certainly, this has been a bit of a hot topic. Uh, in, in uh, society in general lately, uh, but you know there's a lot of misunderstandings about our immunity and how it works. And it's pretty important to understand at least some of the basics uh, of immunity before we understand you know what is going on with these honeybee uh, vaccines. So you guys are going to be my students here for a little bit, but we will we will get to the honeybee vaccine part. So there's different types of immunity. The first one is innate immunity. This is the immunity that you are born with, and your God-given immunity. Uh, you don't have to have any experience in, in the, the world. Um, essentially, it's how you are made. So an example would be your skin. You know, your skin keeps a lot of pathogens out of your body from getting in. Uh, and if you're a bee, your exoskeleton keeps a lot of pathogens from getting in. Uh, there's a lot of innate uh, immunity that I'll talk about as we go through uh, this lecture in, in the hive. It's, it's pretty interesting. The second big group of immunity is acquired uh, immunity. And this is where you have to have some sort of experience in life. You know, life can be rough sometimes, but you know, uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger type of thing. And that's what happens with immunity. Uh, we get exposed to a lot of different pathogens and our bodies are equipped to fight off those pathogens. Under acquired immunity, if you see here, hopefully you guys can see my pointer, there's two different types of acquired immunity that we talk about in science, and that is humoral immunity and cellular immunity. Uh, so those are two different kind of arms of our immune system. Um, humoral immunity is largely associated with antibodies, making of antibodies, and cellular immunity is uh, having to do with our cells, okay, as it says cellular, and if we have pathogens that go inside our cells, uh, that's the way our immune system detects it. So here's a little bit more um, in each one of these types of innate immunity. Um, so can anybody tell me this picture right here, the B picture, and I don't know if you guys, you can yell it out, right? I mean, I'm not there, but I like to like have audience interaction here. Y'all are beekeepers. So like this behavior, what is this? The bees looking at you. Dance. Say that again. Is that the dance? It, they're not doing the dance, but look at these ones that are just looking at you straight out in line here. They're giving you the evil eye. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes they are. And what what's do you know the guys the guard know the name that? guarding. Guarding. I think I heard it. Guarding. Yeah, guarding. This is a, an example of innate immunity that bees have. They guard the hive. And, and, you know, each one of these little bees in the hive is like a cell, like in our bodies, right? So, so 
you know, we think of ourselves as being so different in humans and other animals from bees, but really, you know, as bees being in that hive and being that super organism, they're very much, they have a lot of similarities actually to how a whole mammal body work, a mammalian body work versus that hive. So here's some examples of innate immunity, things you're born with, you know, your anatomy, like I told you, the skin, uh, our, our, our cilia in our lungs. You have little sweepers in your lungs that actually clean out all the junk that you breathe in. Like your, the mucus that comes out of your nose that flushes things out of your body. Even your sweat, your sweat on your skin, and that salt from the sweat keeps a lot of bacteria and things at bay. And even gravity, you don't think of gravity as part of your immune system, but it does. It, it allows things to kind of fall off of you and fall away. Uh, we need to keep the stuff that like screen boards and gravity really helping you out, right? So, you know, all of these things come into play with innate immunity. Also within our bodies, there are various chemicals in our body, like the pH of our stomach. I talked to my students, I said, you know, our time we eat something or drink something, right? That goes down into our stomach. There's a very low acidic pH there. It's like, I, call, I tell my students, it's the pit of despair. And a lot of things get burned up and destroyed whenever it's in your stomach. You know, and this is just, again, part of our normal digestive system, but it keeps a lot of pathogens at bay. We also have normal flora, right? Everybody has normal flora. Uh, if you're a germaphobe, I'm sorry to, to break this to you, but we've got bacteria all over us and all in us, as well as our bees. And maybe some of you guys have read about honeybees. Uh, there's, there's all different types of you know, schools of thought on this, of, of uh, microbials and actually what um, the honeybee gut uh, can be actually a model for the different good bacteria. We're talking about good bacteria that can actually help us out and keep the bad guys at bay. Uh, fever, you know, if you get sick, uh, your body just elevates your, your, your body temperature trying to get rid of those pathogens. Uh, and that's a generic response. It's considered part of innate immunity. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And certainly our bees, they can raise, they can thermoregulate and they can raise their, their temperature. And uh, certainly that can kill off different pathogens. They use that to get rid of um, different things that invade their, um, their hive and, and honeybees can actually withstand pretty high temperatures. Uh, there's also different things in our body. There's something called the complement or a protein cascade. This is very generic. It's just proteins in our blood that if a foreign invader gets into our blood, it just kind of attacks it and sticks onto it. Uh, that's mostly for foreign bodies and things that gets into our body. Uh, interferon, it responds to viruses. Uh, again, very generically. Uh, we also have inflammation. Uh, I don't know what inflammation is. Uh, the beekeeper that you don't like and punch them in the nose. No, I, I don't. No, that's not what I mean. But you know, you you want to smack them in the nose and it gets red, right? And it swells up and you get inflammation and it hurts and it gets um, uh, edema or swelling or vasodilation. Right? But don't don't smack your your buddy in the nose or even the guy that you don't like. But that causes inflammation and and that allows the immune system to get in there and take care of what's ever uh, bothering that individual. Uh, and then phagocytosis, that's a, a fun word for today. Hopefully you guys can practice saying that, phagocytosis. That's when your white blood cells come along like Pac-Man and eat up all kinds of pathogens that might be in your body. Again, these are things you're all born with. And many of these things, bees have a lot of this going on in their blood too. Uh, just hitting and, 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 and tagging and eliminating uh, things that are in their bodies that should not be there. Acquired immunity, a little bit more about that. This gets a little more specific. Remember acquired immunity, you have to live life a little bit. Okay? You have to have some experience. So this allows the body to develop immunity against something that is more specific. Okay. And there are different types of acquired immunity. One is active. Active means your body has to actually do something. It has to have an action against whatever is, whatever pathogen, whatever virus, bacteria is, is attacking your body. 
passive means that you receive something, but your body didn't make it. Okay, so it's going to be like a medication or a vaccine okay, that fights off uh, that particular pathogen. Then you can also have acquired immunity uh, that natural or artificial. Okay? Natural means that you're living life. Uh, you're not intervening in any kind of artificial way. There's no medical intervention. It's just you get exposed naturally to a pathogen, or as you see the picture over here, you get something from your mama, uh, and that's considered a natural immunity uh, requirement as well. Artificial means somebody else gave you something, okay? so it's been given to you from an artificial source. Okay. So let's work through some examples and I'll see if I can get you guys to answer some of these. So if you're, exp so you can be one of these and one of these, and so we can make combinations of acquired immunity. If you are naturally exposed to a pathogen, okay? So you're riding along in the bus and somebody sneezes all over you, right? You get exposed. What do you think that is? Do you think that's active or passive? Your body's gonna fight that off. Can I hear anything from the audience? What's your body got to do? Active. I think I heard active. Good. Is that natural or artificial? Natural. That's good old nature, right? So your body to fight that off, if you get natural infection, that's natural active immunity, or oftentimes it's just called natural immunity somewhat inappropriately, but it's, it's active natural. Your body's got to make something to fight that off. How about mama's milk? You guys think about that. Is that active or passive? Passive immunity. Yeah, that's passive immunity. Is it natural or artificial? Natural. That's as natural as you can get, right? Mama's milk. So mama's giving it to you, so that's passive, but it's natural. Okay, so natural, passive, acquired immunity. How about a vaccine? Active. That's active. Yeah, your body's got to respond to that vaccine. Okay. When you get a vaccine, your body still has to do something. It's got to respond appropriately, hopefully, to that vaccination and, and get you some immunity. But is it natural or artificial? Artificial. It's artificial. Okay. And that leaves one more left. Preformed antibody medication. Preformed antibody medication is there's already a medic, uh, antibodies to a particular disease and it's given to you as a medication. So that's going to be both artificial and passive. Your body doesn't have to do anything. Probably the best example I can give you of this is um, if you've ever, uh, do you guys have rabies out there in, in Utah in your wildlife population? Hopefully very little. Not yeah. Much. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have a lot in Pennsylvania. That's where I'm, I'm broadcasting from. But uh, we have a lot, but rabies is like, you know, just you walk out in the woods, it's, it's around, but if you get exposed, if you get bitten by a raccoon or something like that, you guys might not even have raccoons out there, or some wildlife bites you, they're actually going to give you preformed antibodies for rabies so you don't get it, which is very helpful given that situation. Uh, so with all of these, it's important to understand ways that you can acquire immunity. It's also important uh, to understand the primary versus secondary response. If you get sick, you get exposed to something for the first time, usually that's whenever you're going to have the most severe reaction. Okay? And the whole idea of acquired immunity is that you either, you know, you get this, if you have natural active immunity, you get this and hopefully you survive it. And if you come across that pathogen again, you're not going to have much of a response in a secondary way. So you get a second time exposure. Your secondary response is going to be much more quick. The immune system is going to take it out and you're not going to have clinical signs. Or you're not going to be real sick. Same idea with, with a vaccine. Uh, mother's milk is preformed antibody is that we want to skip this primary response totally. We don't want you to get sick. Uh, we want it to either be uh, no signs whatsoever or we want to make those signs much more mild. Uh, I don't know if you can see the swarm picture over here, but. It's all falling down. All right, so with acquired immunity, a little bit more about that, humoral and cellular, I mentioned this to you. This involves actually blood cells, okay, white blood cells, when we're talking about mammals, um, B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, maybe you guys have heard of those before. Uh, it's actually uh, true that B 
bees actually have white blood cells too, not exactly like us, but um, they do have some, uh, mostly when they're innate immune use. But with us, we have B cells, lymphocytes, and that's part of the B cells, lymphocytes are part of, of the humoral immunity. These are the ones that actually make antibodies against the pathogen. Now, honeybees do not do this, okay? They do not make antibodies. They don't have the same type of humoral immunity that we do. So we can't use antibody um, uh, vaccines to make them make antibodies, which a lot of vaccines that are given to humans and animal animals do. Okay? So keep that in mind. Then there's also cellular immunity. These are largely run by cellular immunities are largely run by T lymphocytes, which if you have cells that are infected with bacteria or viruses where it's actually inside the cell, they can identify those cells and actually usually kill your own cells, but also try to take out uh, the infection, infectious agent as well. All right, you're like, when is she going to start talking about money? Well, here we go. So honeybee immunity, uh, a lot of what I've talked to you about already, there's a lot of similarities. And, and the more we learn about honeybees, the more we learn that they have uh, immunity that's more like mammals or similar to mammals than we thought. Uh, we used to think they didn't have any or very little immunity at all uh, or no humoral immunity. And while they don't make antibodies, they do have a fair amount of uh, tools in their toolbox here. So when we talk about honeybees, we talk about individual versus colony immunity, very much like an individual is like a cell. So this is cellular immunity, and then the colony is the whole you know, organism um, and all of the things that go along with it, the innate immunity, uh, humoral and cellular immunity. So when we talk about bees specifically, Big parts of their innate immunity is going to involve their exoskeleton, much like our skin. They have a natural flora, uh, actually somewhat similar to what we have. Uh, propolis, how many of you guys know that propolis is antimicrobial, antibacterial? Uh, uh, so it, it seals up that hive, uh, keeps some of the bad things out and, and prevents uh, some infections. So propolis can be uh, very helpful. Hygienic behavior, where Bees are cleaning out uh, very uh, cells, maybe dead bees or dead larvae, um, more hygienic bees can actually have a little bit better innate immunity uh, within, within reason. Uh, leaving or absconding from a, an area, bees will just leave if their uh, nest has some issue with it. Uh, undertaking bees, you know, taking out your dead, eliminates some sources of disease. Uh, that nest defense behavior that I showed you, those guarding bees is considered part of their innate immunity. Uh, bees are also very good at regulating temperature and humidity within their hives, and that was part of their innate immunity as well. Bees also have a blood type. We don't call it blood. It's a hemolymph because they have an open circulatory system. So they have a heart that kind of pushes the fluid throughout their body, but they don't have vessels like we do. It's and when you're little, you can get away with that. But in their hemolymph, they actually do have blood cells or uh, hemolymph cells, hemocytes or is the, the correct name for them. And they can eat up bad things, bad things like man coming along eating it up. And they can shoot out enzymes that destroy the bad thing. And the hemocytes can actually be activated. And a lot of those um, things we already talked about for other animals can be activated. So they certainly have this, this arm of cellular immunity, uh, just like we do, or similar to what we do. They also have a bit of what we now kind of classify as their humoral immunity. And they have fat bodies and they have uh, vitelligenin. Uh, and have you guys heard of their fat bodies and what yeah, yeah, composition yeah. they are? Yeah, and, and you'll be talking about Varroa here later, so we'll, we'll get into that. And, Telogenin is a um, protein that is very important in humoral immunity and transferring information, immune information around the body of the bee. So that acts very much like what an antibody might do or some of the cells that are involved in humoral immunity, but they don't produce antibodies like we do. And an antibody is when you get exposed to something, your B lymphocytes produce 
a, a antigen or an anti a antibody against that particular antigen, meaning the pathogen, and it can keep that information that's like a tag, you know, to that antigen, to that pathogen, and those uh, B cells will keep that in the body for decades, maybe even your whole life. And then if you ever get exposed to that pathogen again, it's like they already have the battle plans to um, how to kill that antigen. So antibodies are really helpful to have. Um, again, honeybees don't make them, but give me a minute here and I'll show you what they have. So before we, we put that all together, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about vaccines. So I am only going to, here's my disclaimer. I'm going to talk to you about how traditional vaccines work. I'm not going to talk to you about how MN, mRNA vaccines work. So I'm just going to drop that right in the table here. And so I'm going to be talking to you about traditional vaccines uh, and vaccine science uh, prior to the last year or two. So I'm going to throw that controversy right out the window. And all of the vaccines that I'm going to be talking about, and honeybee vaccines, by the way, would fall under uh, this traditional science as we understand vaccines. So with traditional vaccines, we have two major types that we often talk about. One is live vaccines, and the other one is killed vaccines. Right? So with a live vaccine, uh, what that means is that we actually have a component of that pathogen, of that bacteria, of that virus, real, there, active, and we take that and we give it to the patient and okay? give it to the person, the animal, whoever it is. But we don't, you know, they'll be like, well, that's just like getting it naturally. Well, no, not exactly. What they do is they actually take that pathogen and they do something to it called attenuation. You know, attenuate something, you weaken it in some way that you make it less likely to infect you or cause disease anyway, so your body can deal with it. So it's, it's a weakened form of the real thing, essentially. The other uh, type of traditional vaccine are what we call killed vaccines. Killed vaccines are not an active you know, full pathogen. It might just be a part of that pathogen, maybe a particular protein um, that can at least cause an antibiotic, or sorry, antibody, excuse me, antibody uh, formation uh, against a piece or a part of that pathogen. So it'll cause the body to form antibodies, but there's no possibility of that vaccine causing actual disease, like that the pathogen's not gonna suddenly like wake up, get okay, and, and, and cause disease like it would in a natural exposure, okay? Vaccines, the whole point is should introduce less risk than natural exposure to the pathogen. We want to skip that primary response. I mean, there's a lot of things we get exposed to that our body deals with just fine, but there's some diseases that have high mortality rates and we don't want to have to deal with that. We would rather have a vaccine so we can prime our bodies to have antibodies already there, um, have some cellular responses as well. So it's already there, already present, so that if we meet that pathogen in life, uh, we can skip that primary response and our body's already ready to handle it. And we will either not get sick at all or we'll be not nearly as sick as we would have been. So this is especially uh, needed for these diseases that have high mortality rates um, and a high likelihood of exposure. You know, if it's a, a disease that you know, everybody's going to get and the mortality rate is less than 1%, it's kind of dumb to have a vaccine. Uh, there's, or at least certainly to give it to everybody, maybe high risk groups, maybe people that are immunocompromised. But if you've got a really low risk disease, you know, there's not a, there shouldn't be anyway, a market for vaccinations. Um, it, it, it also depends on what your exposure is. You know, there's, different diseases in different parts of the world. Uh, for example, you know, if you go overseas, you might have to take a few vaccinations that you wouldn't normally need if you lived in the United States. So it really depends on, um, again, what your likelihood of exposure is. And certainly we can apply that in human medicine and veterinary medicine, but we can also apply it with our bees too. All right, sorry to show you a bad, scary picture. Has anybody ever seen this? 
Yep. American Falcon. Yep. You don't want to see it. Yep. Okay. So, uh, you know, this is a big scary disease for a, a lot of beekeepers. Uh, I could certainly talk to you about it for quite some time. Um, what, what do you guys do in Utah? What's your state tell you to do? Do you have to burn hives? What's your it's, strongly, it's strongly encouraged. Okay, so it's not, you don't have to, but they really recommend it. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. All right. So are you guys using antibiotics on a periodic basis or prevention? Not, not prophylactic. Anybody going to admit that? In the, okay. We're, we're not that you'd admit. It's okay. I won't tell on you. But um, yeah, you know, this is this has been the reason. This is a historic disease as well as the disease that's here presently. And it's really the reason for much of the development of the apiary programs in, in states. And, um, you know, it's, we just, the, the antibiotics, and I, and I hope you guys know this um, without getting too far off on a tangent here, you know, they, they really just mask the disease because this is a bacteria that forms spores. And you can treat with antibiotics, but it's too important for the spores and every one of these little cells where you get this, this black scale, you know, can put billions with a B uh, spores out into the environment, you know, and then you multiply that times how many cells are infected in the hive. I mean, it, it just is an explosion of these spores. And if you have your hives on antibiotics, it'll mask it for a period of time because it doesn't allow the spores to go into an infective state. But uh, pretty much our whole country, you know, all of our dirt uh, is, uh, contaminated with these spores. So it's, it's considered to be throughout the United States, pretty much what's called an endemic disease, which means it's you know, present just about anywhere. Um, but there's really no good treatment for it. We can, we can try to avoid it. There's, there's things we can do with biosecurity. You know, you don't want to be bringing in uh, old hives, old equipment uh, into your yard. So there's a lot we can do with trying to prevent it with biosecurity or at least high risk exposure or high level exposure. Um, but antibiotics don't do much at all. So this is a disease that you know, we really need to find a better solution for. And I, I sure hope, I sure hope that we have. Um, you know, the first vaccination uh, available for bees has been developed for American Falbert. So here's some of the basics on American Falbert. I'm sure a lot of you are well versed in this. Uh, again, it's infectious, contagious, spore forming bacterial disease. It's penne bacillus larvae. Okay? And it affects primarily the capped, capped brood. Uh, you can see it in the kind of late uh, larva of the pupal stage. And it's certainly considered to be one of the worst diseases that we have uh, in the app culture industry doesn't take many spores to infect the hive and, and cause clinical illness. Uh, although, you know, a fair amount of our hives, there's, there's some, not a lot of great evidence on this, but probably a lot of our hives have some level of natural immunity to this, or our colonies have some natural immunity. Uh, what happens essentially is the spores, uh, once they get into a colony, they uh, are Second, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, you're back. All right, I don't know where I got lost here, but okay, I'll just turn it. Okay, so you can still hear me see my slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. perfect. Okay, sorry about that. Don't know what happened. I kind of live out in the boonies a little bit, so it might be on my end. Uh, our internet is uh, it's like three hamsters running the tower. <laughs> so, 
I don't know what it's like out in Salt Lake City, but uh, you, know, you guys are in the city there, but I'm, I'm out in the country a bit here in PA. Um, anyway, so did you guys hear anything on this slide? Yeah, the first part. Okay. Okay, so the first little, okay. So it doesn't take much to infect uh, a couple spores, you know, whenever <laughs> infected hives are putting out billions of spores, it doesn't take much to uh, get a high exposure. So they germinate in the larval gut, and then once the, the larvae are fed from the nurse bees, it gets into what's called this vegetative form, okay? And it starts to uh, grow and proliferate, and uh, the gut actually is breached. They, they blow out of the gut, and they get into the, the hemolymph or the bee blood, and it causes just a complete infection. Sepsis is a complete infection in the body larva. So you get these dead larvae, uh, that typically die after after the capping in the cells. They can die before and um, they they die. And now you have all this dead to a pile of goo, and you get this uh, consistency uh, at first, but then it dries out and into this brown black scale. And that consistency, as you guys may know, you can actually do the match that test and stick a piece of wood or whatever in and pull it out. If it's longer than two centimeters, then that's fairly diagnostic for American fowl brood. Uh, again, each of these larvae contains billions of spores. A uh, big problem is, is that, you know, Pettis bacillus larvae, they're resistant to spores, in particular resistant to antibiotics, any kind of chemical treatment, UV light, Temperature, humidity, they don't go away. They persist in the environment uh, for decades. Uh, some portions of you can say it's up to 70, 80 years. Probably more like 40, but it's still long enough. If you got ground that's contaminated, you got it. So, again, you know, American fowl brood, you don't want to have it. It's pretty much lethal to your colony. Uh, it's going to kill your colony and everybody else around it, uh, potentially. Bees can fly and spread this, um, and and again, it's it's really endemic, you know, on Earth. It's it's in every continent. Uh, it's not that you ever really get away with it. It's just that if you have a bunch of colonies that are infected, they're they're just really putting out the spores, so you get like a hot spot um, of it that that can take over uh, the the natural immunity of any hive to fight it off. Uh, and again, most most states are either going to tell you you got to burn or they're going to recommend that you burn just to try to keep uh, that coming out and um, causing an explosion of spores in that area. So as you guys know, uh, again, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, it could be a significant loss uh, for uh, hives and colonies and uh, sweat and tears and uh, economic loss. Uh, and it can be in the environment again for a long time and often covert. You know, we probably have a lot of covert infections in, in hives uh, because we're using antibiotics, you know, preventatively and, uh, you know, some bees probably handle it. Um, again, it's the original reason, and I, I say original re reason for state apiary programs, because certainly bees have a, enough problems to keep the inspectors busy, and then some. Um, American fowl brood is just one of them, but I think you know, with the Varroa, uh, American fowl brood's taken a bit of a, a backseat on you know, the worst thing that's going on, but um, it's certainly on the list. We've also seen, uh, because so many antibiotics have been used uh, over the years and still currently, um, we see antibiotic resistance. And this is, this is well documented in the bee lab. Uh, when they send in cases of American fowl brood, uh, there's a fair amount of resistance to uh, tetracycline antibiotics because they've been used so long. So uh, beekeepers are using antibiotics on, on the hives and you know that the, the, the uh, bacteria is actually resistant to it anyway. So that doesn't help much. So at our topic, all that background, you guys still hanging out with me? See some still alive there? All right, hanging in. Here we go. So I sent some stuff to Brian too. So there's some uh, materials that I sent. Uh, hopefully you can, guys can get those and, and read about uh, some of this as well. So uh, ho hopefully those uh, can be made available to you, a couple articles and things. 
So vaccination in honeybees, how in the heck does this work? Okay, so now that you guys are, are um, community specialists, um, there's something called in bees called transgenerational priming. Okay? And this is a little bit like, a little bit uh, like mother's milk. Okay, so it is a passive, you remember, uh, natural immunity um, idea where you're going to get, hopefully, um, some level of immunity passed from the queen to her offspring. Okay, and Dayland is the company that's been working on this. And, uh, you know, it hit the news a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago now. Uh, it was the big buzz all around is the vaccine. Uh, but this has been coming for a while. Uh, I shared some articles with you guys that I wrote you know, last year uh, about vaccines and trying to uh, educate people on how vaccines actually work. Uh, so you can, you can check out those articles too. So how they, um, the, the idea behind this is this would be an oral vaccine, okay? An oral vaccine that you could either feed to the workers uh, of a hive. It's, and, and, and trust me, people have asked me about this already. They're like, how are you going to get little needles in each little bee? You know, and, you know, no, I can do that. It's, it's an oral vaccine um, fed to the workers, or what might actually be a little bit more efficient, fed to the queen. Okay, and if you, you know, especially if you're installing a new queen, you can uh, have her in a little queen cage and the queen candy can be, you know, inoculated with this vaccine. So you can put a freshly inoculated queen into the next hive. So uh, that may be a, um, an efficient way of doing this. Uh, there's a link here uh, to Dayland and the, the package insert. Uh, and you guys have this information. Uh, you have a copy of my PowerPoint, uh, so you should be able to have this information. But you can click on this link, and that's actually the package insert to this vaccination. So you can kind of read all about it from Dayland and see what you think about it. So a little bit of history of how they um, did some trials, how they did the background work and research in this. Uh, and and I have been in direct contact with the CEO of this company. I uh, interviewed her uh, a while back. And, and they're very hopeful for this vaccine. And I'm hopeful that it works out for them too, because if it does, it would, it'll be great for bees and beekeepers. Um, but understand that working with American fowl brood in the field is tough to do. You know, you can't get too many people to sign up for that uh, to uh, experimentally. <laughs> infect their hives with American fowl brood. Uh, and, you know, generally uh, state apiarists, things kind of frown on those types of things to just, you know, perpetuate uh, American fowl brood in the field. Uh, so they have had lim limited clinical studies in the field. I will tell you that most of their studies have been in the lab uh, and they did uh, control groups comparisons. And what they did in short is they, they took a one day old larva and they showered them in the lab with thousands of American fowl brood spores. And they had a control group, ones that they did and ones that they didn't. Uh, and then they also had ones that they, meaning they showered with the spores or they didn't. And then they had uh, ones that had exposure to the vaccine uh, versus uh, exposure to the American fowl brood and then vaccination and the American fowl brood exposure. So in their comparison groups, what they found is that uh, larva that came from vaccinated hives or colonies uh, had a greater survivability uh, and it was fairly significant. Depending on which trial they did, it was anywhere from 30 to over 50% greater survivability. Now that's not 100% true, we'll take note of that. Uh, but it's certainly better than uh, not surviving at all. Uh, so the idea is that it increased, and this is just the larva. So you have to realize, you know, in life, you're not just going to have one, you know, a larva, one larva all by itself getting exposed to the thousands of spores. You're going to have the whole colony. So, you know, they took a little piece of, of immunity out and kind of separated it. 
So that actually is is in their favor, and they they kind of make that point in some of their papers. They're like, you know, if this happens out in the real world, you have all the all the other variables of the hive kind of fighting or trying to fight off this infection too. So this thirty to fifty four percent, while it's not a hundred percent, it certainly is just you know reflecting what we can do with with larva uh, kind of on its own. So. Uh, they also did some comparisons of colony strengths. So you could say, well, you know, what if you had like a, you took this larva from a sick colony already versus they, they, um, they did comparisons on you know, this um, treatment, what it did to the colonies that they took it from, the, the, qu the quality of the honey uh, that was produced by those experimental hives and the queen fitness too. So you can get on their website and actually see some of these um, uh, other things that they looked at because they wanted to make sure that you know vaccinated hives versus unvaccinated hives they weren't seeing big differences in in what those hives were able to produce they didn't want to see those downsides then uh what they did is they they proved this uh transgenerational priming that it actually happens by using some some high tech and and well, it's not that high tech but it's a fluorescent microscope essentially where they, they add a fluorescent uh, particle to the pathogen, it can tag a pathogen, okay? So American fowl brood in this case. Um, and they give, uh, the, this type of vaccine is a killed vaccine, okay? So the antigen that they're giving, antigen refers to the pathogen or a piece of the pathogen, the thing that causes the immune response in the body. This is a killed vaccine, this is a traditional killed vaccine. I already told you what that was. So uh, again, would it be good to use a live vaccine for American fowl brood, right? And you all know why that is. We wouldn't want to just go out there in fireman and keep it up. Um, I'll also tell you, you know, with rabies, for example, uh, rabies, that's definitely a killed vaccine. If you get a rabies vaccine, it's killed vaccine. We don't want to like give you sort of rabies and hope for the best. Uh, so with those high mortality um, type diseases, we usually use killed vaccine. But it's enough of an antigen that causes the body to have an immune response. So they tagged this, this, this antigen, because they wanted to see what happens to the vaccine, right? This antigen is killed vaccine that they make as it moves through the bee. So they put it in sugar feed, okay? And they, uh, the, the workers, they trace you know, each little stage of this. And they take samples and they you know, to do the dissection. They they look under the fluorescent microscope and see if they could actually see this antigen moving through different phases of this. So sugar was in the sugar feed to the worker, went to the worker's gut, out to the hemolymph, and then to the glands, the hypopharyngeal glands, you know, that produces the food, the real jelly and the brood food and things. Um, so then that was fed to the queen and you can put this in the queen candy by the way too uh and from the queen it goes from her gut to the hemolymph and then it goes to the fat body okay and the fat body that in, it incorporates with the um, vitelligenin and the vitelligenin is an egg yolk protein an egg yolk protein yeah. our queens lay eggs just like chickens lay eggs and there's there's a lot of um immunity that's passed in that egg yolk protein, whether you're a bee or whether you're a chicken or whether you're a person, whatever, okay? Uh, and this, this protein actually grabs on just like it would uh, a cell with antibodies and, and, and tagging in our own immune system. And it takes it to the, to the out of the hemolymph, okay, from the fat body to the hemolymph, goes to there, and then it goes to the ovary and to the egg, and then to the larva, okay? So they prove this transgenerational prime they're talking about is that this antigen that they made, whenever they feed it, it goes in this pathway and it gets into the egg to the larva, okay? So it's not, you know, queens don't have mammary glands, right? But this is a way they can actually pass on this antigen, exposure to this antigen to the larva. And then the larva has seen this antigen and has a bit of a uh, primary response so that it's it, it's kind of like being, again, like vaccinated there before, you're gonna skip a lot of that primary response 
And if that larva would be exposed, it's going to have more of a secondary response than the primary response. They also did a little bit of uh, uh, research on some of the, the proteins, the immune proteins that start to get made by uh, some of the bees' bodies. And there's something called Defense in One. I think there's going to be more information coming out about this. We'll read about it. But it's, it's showing that it's actually increasing uh, some of the protein and kind of enzyme responses uh, in these bees uh, to kind of alert them uh, that something is going on uh, with their immunity. Uh, so again, it, it's, it's sort of priming um, this, these bees, these larvae, uh, to have a, you know, an easy primary response so that they would actually get naturally exposed. They're already in that secondary level. So the current approval, it's called Pedibacillus larvae bacterin, okay? And, and they want you to know that, that this is not GMO, it's not mRNA, it, there's no chemicals or metals or anything in the product. You know, and that's important because a lot of vaccines do have adjuvants added to it that are metallic in nature and all of that. So if you're an organic beekeeper, uh, this should not offend you in any way. And, you know, if, if you're not, it won't offend you either. So um, it's, it's one of those things that doesn't have a lot of extra stuff in it. It just has uh, the Bactrin in it, which is a, a protein, a killed, you know, it's a killed, killed uh, vaccine. It's just a piece of American Foulbrood. Uh, there's also no withdrawal time. So you can feed this to your bees and it's not gonna have any effect on your honey. You, know, you can use it whenever. Uh, again, killed pathogen. You're not going to start an outbreak of American Foulbrood uh, if you use this. Now, currently it is approved by the USDA. USDA as a conditional approval, okay? And the reason why it's been conditionally approved is because it's the first of the kind. The USDA is con convinced there's an urgent need because there just isn't anything really to treat American child food. And they've deemed it to be relatively safe, pure, and there's a reasonable expectation, and this is their terms, of efficiency, okay? It's something they want to get out into the market quickly. Okay, so all of these things, no matter what you think about them, that's kind of the uh, criteria for getting conditional approval. Um, they won't get full approval until they start to do more field trials and they have to prove um, some of their, their potency testing. Okay? Uh, from what they're telling me, uh, they are working with uh, larger scale commercial operators. Anybody on those trials? Anybody out in Utah? No one in this room. No one in that one. Well, it'd be cool if you were. I, you know, and I don't, I'm trying to get more information out of the company on this, but they don't tell me too much. I wish they'd tell me more. But, they haven't. but apparently they have some contracts with large scale commercial fields uh, uh, trials to con conduct field trials with these commercial keepers. So I'm not sure exactly what they worked out with them, but um, they're, they're trying to get some more field data, which would be great. Um, if they get that, their ultimate goal, if they can really show that it works in the field in this larger scale, uh, then that they're gonna be able to get full approval. And if that works out, that'll, that'll be really all awesome actually for everybody. Uh, what they are saying is that it needs to be applied and reapplied each season. Uh, I, I would suspect that if you would re-clean, you would probably need to, you know, have a vaccinated queen put into your hive too. So, so you need to either reapply it to the, the colony every season or have a, a vaccinated queen every season or every time you change queens, I would think. Um, they sell it in full bottles and uh, full bottles, they say, will treat 50 queens or, or 50 colonies, if I'm going to think about it. And it's supposed to be ready uh, by the end of April is what they're telling me now. So there's a few other possible targets. I mean, really American Foulbrood, if this works, um, American Foulbrood is really the tip of the iceberg. You know, I think it would 
eliminate the property not things we worry about, uh, but certainly there's a lot of other things that we worry about, probably even more. Uh, and they are working on, if, if they can get this vaccine to work, they're working on American foul brood, a European foul brood combination uh, vaccine, as well as a European foul brood vaccine, chalk brood, and then very honey honeybee viruses. This would be fantastic if they could start working on honeybee viruses. I don't know if you guys deal with bee forming virus out there, uh, but it's pretty predominant where I'm at. And, um, you know, you, you, it's just insult to injury when you add Varroa and then you add all the honeybee viruses. And, and every time I turn around, they're finding another one. And then, of course, Nosema uh, too would be a, a nice one to have. So, you know, this could lead to uh, vaccinations for other uh, potential targets and other pathogens. So there, there could be some great benefits for this. You could actually get, you know, pre-vaccinated queens. Uh, so you know, any queen breeders in the audience? A couple yeah. of small ones would be cool. Yeah, so that could be a new craze, you know. I if it works it would actually be really awesome um so you could have pre-vaccinated queens you know you send them in and send them with vaccinated queen candy and they can vaccinate themselves on the way there um it would also the the other wonderful thing that this would do is it would remove antibiotic issues yeah. and antibiotic resistance i mean the whole reason why um i'm talking to you guys uh it isn't because, uh, you know, admittedly that I was, I fell in love with honeybees. I mean, I have since, but uh, the reason I got interested in this was because I'm interested in public health. Uh, veterinarians do a lot of you know, work with public health, uh, which means not just animals, but taking care of people. And in 2017, which, you know, the FDA and in their infinite wisdom put out that, you know, there should be no more antibiotics over the counter. It kind of threw a ringer in, in the whole industry for, for veterinarians and for beekeepers. And by the way, for a fair amount of other uh, uh, agricultural producers that were used to being able to get their own antibiotics. Uh, but, you know, beekeepers had been doing it on their own and, and veterinarians were like, what do you think about bees? And uh, it kind of created a, an interesting problem. And I was in a position where I could go out and study it a little bit uh, and hopefully try to find some solutions. Uh, I think you know, that's what you try to do. When you're a doer, you find a problem and you try to figure out how to make it better. So, um, and I'm sympathetic uh, to both, both industries. So antibiotic resistance, uh, if you look into it, and, and this is when antibiotics don't work anymore for different diseases. And tetracycline is a very, very important antibiotic, a very, very important antibiotic for humans. And if it starts, stops working for a lot of our diseases, we're in trouble. Uh, and antibiotic resistance, you know, most, most health agencies, health agencies, if, if they're honest, they will admit that antibiotic resistance is the biggest public health threat it makes, and not COVID, <laughs> it's, it's, it's antibiotic resistance. It would be really great if we could eliminate uh, the need uh, for beekeepers to feel that they need to use antibiotics uh, on a prophylactic uh, way to prevent American foul brood. Um, if we can have something that's going to be out of our honey and uh, we don't have to worry about it, that would be wonderful. So uh, this this could have a, a, a great uh, you know, prevention in, in money losses uh, if. Yeah, if we can get it to work. So now there's some great things. There's a... Uh-oh. Hey, guys. Looks like you lost me again. You're back. Hey, what yeah. you might want to do is shut your video off. That'll... that'll... Free up some bandwidth. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. Did you get uh, the last slide? I don't know when I cut out. We only oh. lost you for about five seconds. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So, you know, with good things, sometimes bad things come along, and there certainly are some challenges, right? Convincing the industry to use the vaccine and stop using antibiotics. I mean, that's it's a crapshoot, you know, I, you know, 
got to switch from something you know or something that you don't uh, and if, not sure you know if it's going to work or not um i don't know i have no idea if this vaccine is going to work on a mass scale uh, we have some good data uh, but data in the lab and data with some small clinical trials is not the same as you know putting it out in the real world uh, there's also you know potential for a new strain development is this going to work on all potential strains of penny bacillus larvae uh, and there's some question of that efficacy. Um, I don't know. I hope it works. I make no guarantees. Uh, I do get some questions that I've seen already from beekeepers uh, that uh, I, I wanted to, to clarify. Uh, I did get this one. They were worried that the vaccine will mask American foundry. Um, and, and and that's not one thing we would worry about. I mean, we worry about antibiotics masking American foundry, but um, the vaccine, I mean, if it doesn't work, uh, it certainly wouldn't mask it <laughs> at all. Uh, and if it um, does work, um, what it's gonna do is it's working with, it, it's not a medication, you know, that's, that's working on its own. It's a vaccine that's allowing the hive to increase its own immunity. So it's, it's, it's a natural immunity that we're trying to you know, bolster. So it, it's really just allowing these hives to be able to take care of themselves a little bit more. So in, if it works, the idea over time is you're gonna have more hives that have a higher immunity against exposure to, to a disease we know they're gonna get exposed to. American foulbrood disease is everywhere but they're gonna be able to get past that primary uh, response much more often and have a secondary response. And then you're not gonna get infected hives that produce more spores. So um, over time, if you have less and less hives that are producing less and less spores, now this is gonna take some time because the spores can persist in the environment for you know, 70, 80 years, but over time, if we can vaccinate everybody for American fabric and we get a lot less spores put out, it's gonna reduce it overall. So it won't uh, completely eliminate them, but over time it may uh, reduce uh, spores. It's gonna take a while. Uh, maybe, maybe my grandkids would figure it out. All right, so here's some references and things that I used. Um, again, you guys have all of this information uh, available to you. So let's see how I did with time. Okay, yeah, we got about uh, you know 15 minutes or so for questions. Uh, if you ever wanna get in contact with me, uh, here's my uh, professional email. Uh, we also have a, if you wanna check out what we're doing, we have a website and uh, I, I write for bee culture about once a month or so too. So you can see what's on my mind by reading some of those articles. And I shared a couple with you on, on vaccine. All right. Yeah, still there? Yeah, here. Okay. So uh, questions? You can have one comment. Uh, there is there is a comment from one of our online participants. The the, okay, let me look just, here. Is it in the, in the chat? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything. Oh, probably because you uh, got knocked off. Here, I'll copy and paste it. This is from... Yeah, I'm not seeing anything in the chat on my end. Yeah, this is a question I wrote before class even started. She's oh, answering here it is. Here, 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 to those questions. Something. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It says, I'm a small scale bee, queen bee breeder. That one? Yeah. On the list, uh, okay. Cool. You have to let me know how that works out. Neat. Dr. Rohn, question. So I understand that uh, this immunity is not passed from uh, queen to daughter. So if you were if you were raising queens from a vaccinated queen, that immunity does not trend, does not 
make it to the next generation. Is that true? And if so, I guess based on your explanation, I don't understand why that does not go to the next generation. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know where that's coming from. So, so it, if you have a queen and she's vaccinated, uh, if in theory, uh, any egg that she lays should be vaccinated, essentially. So that would be the next. If you, put, if you requeen and you put the queen in a hive that already has workers that you know would not be her daughters, or if uh, your queen uh, requeens. And there's a new queen that comes back, you know, um, you know, that's going to be tricky. So, but if you have a queen that you know that you have vaccinated, every every egg that she lays should be should be vaccinated. That's my answer in that thought. question. Yeah, that's what I thought based on your explanation. So you've got a vaccinated queen, you graft from that queen and you create, you know, two or three hundred. 500, 1,000 new queens, those daughters, you know, would, would have that immunity and would therefore pass it on to their colonies, assuming again that they, you know, went out, got made, and came back, et cetera. Is that your understanding? Oscar, she's muted. We can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Yeah, so I think the last question I heard was that um, it should be passed on to that next generation. Now, I haven't heard them talk much about grafting, uh, but that's a that's a pretty interesting um, take on it because technically, you know, every egg that uh, you're taking from that vaccinated queen, should have that immunity passed on to them. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense to me. I Again, I can't remember, but some of the early information that I saw on this, they were saying that that was not the case. And therefore, you know, you'd have to either be buying a vaccinated queen or vaccinated your queen in each generation. So that's, that's yeah, I issue. think they're not, you know, I think they're still working on how often, you know, you would need to report you know, reapply it to a hive. You know, they're they're recommending right now uh, that you reapply it every season. So, and that's a question that I haven't gotten a lot of answers for. So, say that you have a queen that's in a hive and she overwinters, and it's the same. It's you know, it's a second year queen. Um, they're they're telling you that you should reapply it that second year. Okay. So that, so that that indicates to me that there's some sort of duration of effect that they're concerned about. To, to me, I mean, once that queen would be inoculated, I mean, her, yeah, you know, I don't know that it wears off. It shouldn't. Yeah, but I, I think, you know, think about it from the, the company's perspective. You know, that's economics. Yeah, that's, that was my, that was the skeptic in me, thinking that this is, is yeah. basically uh, the company's way of creating more of an annuity in terms of revenue. Yeah. Because you guys have already figured out, hey, I get one vaccinated queen, I'm just going to create a vaccinated queen for the rest of my life, you know, with, with grafting. You all figured that out already. They probably don't like that. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know how long, I don't know how long they're going to guarantee uh, duration on this. It's a good question, but yeah. It really wouldn't be unprecedented. I mean, my dog has to be vaccinated for rabies every two or three years. Yeah. Um, my, my vaccination has to be updated, but I don't think we can anticipate it would perpetuate forever in a genetic line. Yeah. There would be some generational loss. In right, <laughs> right. Yeah, I would think, I, 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 I would think they're probably going to say that every new queen needs to have a fresh vaccine. But, yeah. Is there any concern about mutation of the, so where the vaccine quits working to the mutation? Uh, mutation of the the bacteria or the yeah. agent. So so with penicillus, uh, different strains. Yeah. So they are. Th that's a question, and I think I, I I addressed that a little bit in the PowerPoint. They're they're not sure if this is going to be affected on any type of of different strains or if new strains would emerge um, from penicillus or 
uh, or any other, you know, infectious agent. Uh, you know, that's a potential possibility. It's one of the things I learned. There was a company here in Utah that was developing a, a product that would actually uh, cure AFB using phages, but they, and they indicated there was like five or six different strains of, of uh, yeah. AFB. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I was just curious about that. Yeah, as far as I know, there, I don't know how much extensive testing they've done on, on all of the known strains at this point. Um, but I think at least what they know with common strains, I think they're saying that it's going to work. Uh, but I don't know how extensive they have done their studies on strains and, and it's potential that yeah, new strains can emerge. I mean, that's that's a possibility. So, great, Ron, um, that you mentioned that the worker can sugar feed or can, can feed the uh, queen through royal jelly and, and uh, pass on this vaccine that way or through queen candy. And I assume that's feeding the queen directly when right. she emerged. Is there yeah. any difference? in the efficacy of uh, the vaccine uh, being passed on to the workers from the queen if she was fed as, yeah. uh, you know, through royal jelly right. or medicine and over. Yeah, you would think because there's more steps, you know, in one, one versus the other, but they have traced it, you know, both ways. Um, I think feeding the queen you know, queen candy when when she's in transport kind of type of thing, or, uh, you know, if you cage her and put her in your hive, however you want to do that. Um, I mean, that's a more direct effect, right? Um, but as far as the research they've done, I mean, they've traced it all the way from, you know, feeding the workers, feeding it to the workers, and then the workers feeding it to the queen, uh, to feeding it directly to the queen, and it, it being the same type of effect eventually. As long as it gets to the queen and, and gets into her body, uh, every egg she puts out after that should be considered inoculated, at least for a period of time. At least, and again, they're claiming for a season, so whatever that means. I got a message. Sorry, go ahead. My question is along the lines of uh, the masking. Could you lightly touch on masking? So, like, if you have AFB today that appears in a hive, you know, it's readily obvious. Um, with the vaccination, wouldn't you have a, a, a possibility of, you know, having those bees inside of a hive that, that is infected? You wouldn't wear as infected, all that stuff. And you're not seeing those symptoms. As you were talking about the masking wouldn't occur, but I can definitely see how it could because you're treating the bees themselves, but you're not treating the infected woodenware that can pass along those spores to other colonies. Say, I move a frame. Yeah, I mean, you're, you know, yeah. And, and this is this is um, this is the question, and 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 what you have to realize is that we can't vaccinate the earth right for the spores. The spores are always going to be there. They're always going to be there, and and I know that you know beekeepers are are afraid of old hives and old woodenware that that harbor, you know, high concentrations of spores, as you should be. However, um, you know, you still need to practice good biosecurity in your yards. That's never going to go away, right? Spores in in the dirt are still going to be there when you vaccinate a hive, that hive is not going to perpetuate any more spores and they're gonna have a higher defense against any exposure that they may receive. And they are gonna be received. I mean, every, every even if you say you've never seen American fowl brood and you've never you know, had American fowl brood clinically, if you live on earth, the dirt potentially has American fowl brood most hives are likely to be exposed at least to a low level of American fowl brood, even though they're not showing clinical signs. So the, the vaccine isn't gonna change what already is. Uh, you, don't, you, don't, you don't like to, to know, 
feel that you know that American Valbury is all around you. You know, most people don't like to know that you have trillions of bacteria crawling around on you, but it, but it is. Right? Um, it's kind of like, uh, and the example I give is, and this is a Pennsylvania example. So, sorry, sorry about this, but it, it, in Pennsylvania we have rabies in our wildlife population. It just, it just is. Okay. And rabies is a pretty scary disease. It has almost 100% mortality rate in everybody. But we're never going to get rid of it. I mean, we know we, in Pennsylvania, if we have uh, 400 or less cases of rabies, uh, that's a good year in our wildlife population. But what we do to prevent it in humans, as well as in our animals, is we vaccinate. Uh, we vaccinate our canine. And uh, that's the state law here have to have your vac your canines vaccinated. And that actually prevents it from the exposure in humans largely. Because um, canines are the biggest exposure for humans in, in passing rabies uh, worldwide. So it's not that we can't, we can't eliminate it. We can't, we know it's there, it's out in the woods, but we can vaccinate against, against it and prevent it in uh, you know, our dogs and in our, ourselves. Hopefully that makes sense. It, it, it does partially, but when you, when you have an infected hive, you have the spore counts that are so high that you're increasing your chances of transmission across. Oh, yeah. The yeah. Well, this is if you've got a clinical hive, you've got a clinical hive. Vaccine is not, it's not a treatment. It's not a treatment, it's a prevention. If you got an infected hive, you, you need well, to burn it. To, I understand, but if I have vaccinated bees inside that infected hive, Will it demonstrate the, the disease? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Can you say that one more time? Sure. I, say I have vaccinated bees in a hive that's highly infested by spores, so it's a, it's a clinical hive. Will the larva in that uh, exhibit the symptoms? They, they won't. They won't. And, and, and it's not an infected hive unless it, it's not a clinical hive until you see clinical signs. Spores are everywhere. Spores are everywhere. But unless those spores are in the gut of the larva and they've germinated and they have started to kill larva, you don't have a clinical hive. Spores are there and you have a perfectly normal hive. That's not considered to be a, uh, a clinical infected hive until you see clinical signs. So Dr. Ron, I'm gonna, I'm gonna regurgitate what's stuck in my head. Uh, stuck in my head is that contaminated equipment is yeah. not uh, a, a clinical hive. So if the bees are healthy, the vaccine theoretically should keep them healthy and prevent a contaminated equipment from from. Uh, yep. Well, that's 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 true. That's true to extent. And I, I, I this is your your question is good. I think I understand a little bit more what you're getting at. One of the things, and this is a this is a hallmark of infection, right, and, and, and disease in general. One factor that makes it likely or less likely for you to get sick with anything is your volume of exposure. Okay, so in other words, an example: if one person sneezes on you with cold virus, versus a hundred people sneeze on you with a hundred with a cold virus, which scenario are you more likely to get the cold? A higher exposure, certainly. Yeah. So it's the same thing with used equipment. If you have used equipment and you suddenly dump, you know, a billion spores on one colony of bees, that's going to be a heck of a challenge versus just what your typical bee is going to get exposed to in the natural world. Okay. So you don't want to, it's, there is nothing in medicine that is one one thing solves all, right? It, you've got to uh, exercise usually a uh, combination of, of treatments and prevention to keep your bees right. It's one variable. So, yeah, I would never uh, have old equipment that you know uh, has been exposed to American fowl brood uh, available first. First of all, I mean, that would be in the burn pile with everything else, uh, and I would never use old equipment. Um, that I don't know where it, you know it, it came from or what its history was. Uh, and yeah, so that would really challenge the vaccine. And I think that's a question for what some of these trials are going to come up with. You know, what, what is the amount of challenge 
uh, that these vaccines can still be affected for. Now, if you were talking to the uh, CEO of the company, she'll tell you that they blasted these larvae with thousands of spores. So the exposure rate they, they did in the lab was pretty darn high. And you also have to realize that out in the in the world, um, it's not just going to be you know, one larva against the world. It's going to be the entire colony and all of its immunity together. So it's it's an interesting question that you ask. Uh, should it help? Yes. Is it a is it a fail safe against high exposure rates? I mean, no, nothing is. I mean, it's a thirty to fifty percent, you know, challenge difference uh, that that they're showing in their trials. But yeah, it would it would not be it would not be smart if you want to keep that hive, that colony together to use old equipment uh, that you know has been exposed to high levels of uh, American foul brood. Hopefully that answers that. Next question here. So I did get a I, I did get a chat here. Uh, I did get a chat question that says, uh, well, I guess it's not really a question. I think it's a uh, comment. They haven't released the costs yet. I heard it, an estimate between of $10 per vaccine. Yeah, they are gonna be sold in 50, 50 dose vows or 50 queen containers. Um, I have no idea what the price is. Uh, so, especially, um, so if the hive had been infected with American Valvery, really seen millions of spores in the area, and because they live in the soil, uh, would it be wise that, uh, that the beekeeper would replace that hive in the same area, or would that not be advised? <clears throat> Yeah, I get this question a fair amount. If you have, and I think I, I couldn't hear everything you said, but I think you said that if you've had an outbreak of American fowl brood in your yards in a certain area, uh, should you put honeybees on that area again as would it be a higher risk? Yeah, it would be because you know, that ground's going to be not just contaminated, but it's going to be really, really contaminated for a long period of time. You know, and if you have a uh, ability to go to another location. Um, not everybody has that ability, but if you have the ability to go to another location, that would be a preventative. Yeah, I think I think that is the question you asked. Yes. Are there any other questions? Looks like we've taken care of it for now, Dr. Perel. Thank you for your time this morning. All right. So just to just to be sure, you guys want me to come back at. Uh, one o'clock your time. Yes, ma'am. Talk about Varroa. Uh, so that would be three o'clock my time. Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, anything else that you guys need for me? You're going to have somebody come in and talk about Varroa control, I think, right? Yeah, we do have another researcher just talking about some of the results of their research out of Canada. Yep. Cool. All right. So you guys will be all varroa out by the end of the day. We, we won't be over this, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, well, I will, should I use the same link in the, the email? Yes, be back yeah. in? Okay. All right, cool. All right, so I will talk to you guys later this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <clears throat> couple more uh, Yes, here to give out. You don't have a blue tag, one of these blue uh, tickets. Raise your hand and we'll get you around. Read a couple here. This is for uh, 10 francs. We're going to, we don't have a short time here, so I got to get a couple of these off. For, uh, 10 frame, 10 deep frames, and a bead brush. Number is uh, 104, the last three numbers. Here you go. No, I just raised my hand for a thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's 104. You didn't win. Edwin, 